interesting area of family law that he does is surrogacy. So if you ever have a question about that, he's probably the expert. Um, Ken is from Rapid City. He uh, went to the University of Kansas for law school. Uh, he clerked for the Kansas Court of Appeals for three years uh, before he um, returned to South Dakota uh, and worked as a public defender and then has been in private practice since. So um, he also, I know, uh, is a mentor and works with the Boys and Girls Club and also coaches daughter's basketball. Is that right? Yes. And so we're no one minds that if you need to take a break, we understand, but we're going to go straight through um, because of weather and various factors uh, without our 10 minute break and try and end around 530. So all right, we'll turn the time over to Ken. Thank you. If uh, like like Marilyn said, I'd like to go straight through. The main reason is uh, I do have to coach my daughter's basketball team tonight, uh, even though it's just practice. Um, who will tell them to get in the layup lines if I'm not there? Uh, and I've just been marveling at all your technology here. I know I'm probably dating myself, but uh, we didn't have anything like that when I went to law school. Uh, so this is really neat. Um, so yes, uh, my name's Ken Cheddar. I uh, went to law school down in Kansas, uh, and I started practicing criminal defense in 1999 when I got a job at the Public Defender's Office in Sioux Falls. I know you guys heard last week from Aaron McGowan, the state's attorney uh, in Sioux Falls. Aaron's a friend of mine, and. Uh, I know I was here last year when he gave his talk, and I, I thought it was very informative, but it did occur to me at the time that unless you're going to go work for a state's attorney's office, much of that information uh, you're never going to need. Um, however, criminal defense is something most lawyers will end up doing at one point or another. Um, whether it be because you work in a firm in a different area, but one of your clients picks up a criminal charge or has a child or family member that picks up a criminal charge, they're going to come to you and say, can you help me? Um, and a lot of times as young lawyers, to further your practice and get it going, you will uh, get on the court appointed list and judges will appoint you to represent indigent clients. That's criminal defense. So I'm hoping that some of the things that I tell you are things that all of you will probably use at some point. Um, if you're really interested in criminal defense and you think you have a, a calling or a passion to do that, then uh, I would recommend that you start out in a public defender's office. And the reason I say that is because as a public defender, that's all you do. Your job is 100% defending uh, people charged with crimes. Now, by definition, those folks are indigent. They can't afford a lawyer, uh, but it's all the same to you. Your job is the same, whether they hired you uh, in private practice or whether you were appointed to represent them or whether your job is just to represent them all the time. Uh, but as a public defender, uh, you will learn very quickly all of the ins and outs of criminal defense. So if any of you think that's what you want to focus on in your career, that is an excellent place to start. Um, now, one of the things you'll hear when you do any type of criminal defense is you'll hear people say, ah, how can you represent those, you know, scumbags? How can you do that? Yeah. And it's true. Some of the people you represent are, uh, well, they've got certain problems. And they, they may not be the most appealing folks sometimes. Um, but one of the first things you've got to remember if you're defending somebody or if you're working in criminal defense is not to have that kind of attitude. Uh, you have to have some empathy towards your client. 
And what I don't like is when people say, oh, how can you represent these folks? As if when you're charged with a crime, you're, you're somehow, you know, no longer human. You're in some other subhuman category of scumbag. And that's just not the case. Uh, you know, people in all walks of life will get charged with crimes, some more than others, sure. But all those people that get charged with crimes, and you, if you're appointed to represent folks, you don't get to pick your client. Okay, they're they're going to come to you, warts and all, and they may have all kinds of problems that drove them to commit their crime. They may have alcohol problems. They may have drug problems. Uh, if they've committed a theft, sometimes it's to support a drug habit. But you've got to remember that they're still people, and they've got families. They've got uh, children, they've got their own goals and hopes, and you need to make sure that the best thing you can do right off the bat is to treat them with dignity. And if you do that, then they're going to trust you. You condescend them and look down on them, and I can't believe you did this, and then they're not going to think that you're fighting for them. So the first thing you've got to do is, is just treat them with dignity, and, and that's pretty easy to do. Uh, and the other neat thing about criminal defense is you hear a lot of great stories. I mean, you're you're dealing with uh, a lot of different people uh, who have done some, sometimes some kind of crazy things, and uh, really worth your time after you get done with doing all the stuff you've got to do with them. Take five minutes and talk to them. Uh, it's you're going to be working with them anyway, and it really helps build that rapport that you need with them, and, you, and you'll learn a lot about about them, and they're you know, really interesting folks sometimes. So, so where do you start? Uh, you get a call from the judge saying, hey, I've been appointed you to represent so-and-so, he's charged with burglary, and uh, he's got court next Friday. What do you, what's the first thing you do? First thing you do, find out if he's in jail. Okay, call the call the jail, call the clerk if they know. But usually you got to call the jail, find out if he's in jail, and find out uh, what his bond is set at. And then if he's not in jail, get an address or contact information from the clerk of court so you can get a hold of him. But if he is in jail, then got to go see him right away. Even if you don't know anything about the case, you don't have any police reports, you don't know who the witnesses are, you don't know the facts, you don't, you can't answer hardly any of his questions yet. Go see him. Okay? And it can be a 10-minute meeting. But the reason that you do that is when this person is charged with a crime, he's got, you know, the state's attorney's office and the police. They're all on one side of the case. They're against him. Uh, and the judge has probably looked down on him and set a bond, and he feels like the judge is against him. He's only got one person on his side, you. And if you don't show up right away just to introduce yourself and say, I'm your lawyer, this is what I know so far, even if it's not much, I'll be back on Wednesday. If you don't do that, he's going to think, my lawyer doesn't care. My lawyer, I've been sitting here for three days. Where's my lawyer? My lawyer isn't here. And you're going to be behind the eight ball with your own client trying to get them to trust you and listen to you. So one of the first things you learn, and I learned as a public defender, is you got a client arrested, they're in jail, get over there and see them. Even if it's only for 10, 15 minutes and you don't have any answers for them, what you're really doing is letting them know I'm here and I'll, and I'll be back. Um, when you do go see him, and I know I'm jumping out of order here, so giving the PowerPoint a hard time. Uh, uh, when you do go see him, one of the first things they're going to want to know is, can you get me out? Right? Can you get me out of jail? That's probably what I would ask too. So uh, you've got to know what their bond is. Now, there's two kinds of bond uh, that a judge can set. One is a cash bond. That means that's how much money they need to get out of jail. So if the bond is set at $5,000 cash, they need to come up with $5,000 cash. 
they got to give it to the jail, then they can get out. Um, the other type of bond is a cash or surety bond. And a surety means they can use a bondsman. And at least in Sioux Falls, uh, the bondsman has to put up 10%. So if there's a $5,000 cash or surety bond, you tell them, hey, we just need 500 bucks to a bondsman. And the bondsman will post the rest. You don't get that 500 back. That's how the bondsman makes his money. But that that's what they need to get out. So, and then the third type of bond really isn't bond at all. It's called the personal recognizance bond, and that's where the judge lets them out without payment of any money. That's obviously what you'd want, and if, if that was the bond, they're probably not sitting in jail to have this conversation. They probably already got out. Um, so your client charged with burglary, uh, let's say he's got a $5,000 bond. He says, I don't have $5,000. Okay. So we need to go and we need to address bond. So he's going to have a, a, a hearing at which you can say, judge, that he's going to be advised of what he's charged with, what the potential penalties are, what his rights are. And they'll look at you and say, anything else? You say, judge, we, we want to address bond. We want to talk about the bond. Okay. Um, there's statutes that talk about what the bond factors are, um, but they generally boil down to two things. Uh, is the person a flight risk and is he a danger to the community? Now, there's other factors such as the strength of the state's case. Because when you have a bond hearing, the state will then read from their police reports, which may be tell half the story, and they're going to say, well, he did this and this and this. And you can't let your client speak because anything they say can be used against them. And you don't want to lay out all of the facts. You don't want to play all your cards, but sometimes you might want to say, Judge, we disagree with that part of it. If you have some facts that are better for your client, you can offer them to the judge to basically try and show that the state doesn't have a strong case uh, and that your client, number one, is not a flight risk. So how do you address whether he's a flight risk? Uh, essentially, it's his ties to the community. How long have you lived in? South Dakota? How long have you lived in Sioux Falls? Do you have an address here? Do you have a job here? How long have you been at that job? Do you have any family here? So if the person is from Florida and they were just passing through and they got pulled over with a carload of drugs, you don't have any ties to the community. And the judge is going to think this person is just going to take off and go back to Florida. So you're going to have a tougher bond argument there. If you've got someone who's a lifelong resident of South Dakota, has got family in Sioux Falls, has a job here, has children that go to school here, you've got a much better argument because you can say, Judge, where is he going to go? This is his home. He's got plenty of ties to the community, contacts to the community. He's going to come back for court. That's the first part of the analysis. The second is whether they're a danger. Um, that depends somewhat on the facts of the case. You know, if it's a uh, case where he had a gun and he shot at somebody, you're probably not getting his bond hold. Um, if it's a case where he passed a bad check, it's not really a danger to the community. If you've got a guy who was caught with some drugs in his pocket, personal use amount, not really a danger to the community. If he's caught with a van load of drugs because he's going to be selling them in the community, then that's more of a danger to the community. So it's very fact specific based on the case uh, and you need to know more about it. Now, when you show up for court, the state's attorney will have a file and they will have police reports in their file that give their side of the story. You've talked to your clients, you know his side of the story, but there's always two sides. So before you start that hearing, go up to the state's attorney and say, can I see the reports in your file. And they're generally going to let you. If they don't let you, you say, judge, you know, during the hearing, you say, judge, I can't respond to this because the prosecutor wouldn't let me see the reports in the file. And then the prosecutor will quickly will give you the reports because you made them look bad. So they'll generally let you read the reports. Then you know what they're going to say. And you may be able to point out, find some things in that report that they didn't want to highlight, but you do. Uh, you know, that your client was cooperative or did not flee, or whatever the fact might be. So look at those reports, 
before you make that argument, uh, and then try to get try to get the bond lowered. You want to talk to your client and say, well, what could you come up with? You can't come up with the five thousand dollars. He says, well, I can come up with a thousand. Then you say, judge, would you lower it to to five thousand cash or surety, knowing that he only needs five hundred then to a bondsman? So have a goal in mind. You don't want to ask for two thousand, and your client says, well, I can't post that anyway. So you Common sense, you've got to talk to your client, what can you come up with? There are also going to be times when you can kind of protect or try to protect your client from himself. Um, example I can give you, and what I mean by that is sometimes your client shouldn't get out because if they get out, they're just going to commit more crimes. And the, really the best place for them, at least in the short term, is to sit in jail get off of the drugs, uh, stay away from the other bad influences they may have, and kind of dry out, for lack of a better term. And this happened to me recently. I had a client, young kid, charged with about four felonies. Possession of methamphetamine, failure to appear in court, a grand theft for stealing some saddles or something. I mean, he had all these pending at once. They got arrested again on maybe another controlled substance. So we go to court. His bond is going to be $8,000 combined on those files. And I, I think I got it lowered a little bit maybe, but it was $8,000. So after the hearing, his parents come up to me, mom and dad. And she says, oh, I, I think we can get that together. Bro. And I said, look, you know, your son is 19, 20 years old. He's just picked up four felonies in about four months here. I don't think you should post his bond. I think you ought to just let him sit there for a little while. Because if you post his bond, he's just going to get in more trouble, make things worse for himself. As it stood at that time, I think I can keep him out of the penitentiary. It's close, but I, I we have a reasonable argument. I think we can keep him from going to prison. He's young, you know. Well, mom, mothers cannot see their children behind bars. Okay? They just cannot. She, did, she just couldn't deal with it emotionally, so she posted the bond, got him out. Okay. One week later, he breaks into somebody's house, steals a bunch of guns, saws off one of the shotguns, prompting a leading eventually to a federal charge for possessing a short-barreled weapon, uh, got arrested in a standoff with the police, I mean, it all went south. Um, and then he spent about a year in the county jail before we finally pled him to a number of different things. And I think he got a six-year penitentiary sentence. So now maybe that would have happened either way. But maybe if mom would have left him there, he would have gotten the drugs out of his system. He would have sat in jail for a couple of months which he was going to get credit for that time anyway against his ultimate sentence, things might have turned out differently. So mom didn't do him any favors there. And so, you, you know, if you get a client and you can tell this person's a little bit out of control, don't hesitate to give that advice to family, even if it isn't always followed. Um, and you do have to deal with family and friends. Now, they can be helpful. You know, you may want to know more about your client's situation, and they can fill in some of those blanks. Um, but sometimes they're less than helpful. They can also be the ones that you know, come up with money to get your client out uh, when they, sh they you do want them out, but they've got to come up with the money. You want to try to get them out if you can. Um, number one, because they're innocent until proven guilty. And when you're detained pre-trial on a bond amount, of course, to all your client, it feels like I'm, I'm guilty already, I'm serving my time here, yet I haven't had a trial, I haven't pled guilty, I haven't uh, been convicted of anything. So you want to get them out for that reason because they haven't been found guilty. And secondly, part of the job you've got to do is try to plea bargain a potential agreement for them um, with the state's attorney as a way to resolve their case. and. If they're in custody, then you are negotiating from a position of weakness. Because the prosecutor will say, huh, you don't like the offer? I guess he can keep sitting there. 
right? They, your client is right where the state wants them. They want them in jail. And you know, despite reading articles about the cost of putting people in jail and the county complaining about that, and uh, other people might say we're locking people up too long, you won't hear that generally from prosecutors. Prosecutors want people in jail. And they assume that everyone they've charged is guilty and therefore they're in the right place, jail. And if you have to try to negotiate a, an agreement with them and your client's in jail, you're not coming from a position of strength. Uh, now, when you have the time, if you can't do it at that first quick meeting, you need to go then get this, the story from your client. And the first thing you need to do is advise them of their rights. Uh, everyone has certain constitutional rights when you're charged with a crime. They need to go over those with them quickly, just so, because later a judge is going to ask them, has your attorney gone over your rights with you? And you want that answer to be yes. Uh, if it's no, then they look at you kind of funny. So, I mean, you've got the right to a trial by jury. You've got the right to an attorney. Uh, at the trial, they have the right to subpoena witnesses. They have the right to confront and cross-examine the witnesses against them. Uh, they're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In felony cases, they have right to a preliminary hearing. So it's a good idea to have a checklist of their rights. You can go over it with them until you've got them all memorized. Then you want to get their side of the story. So start at the start. Tell me what happened. And they'll start giving you names and everything. Be sure to get full names, phone numbers, addresses of potential witnesses. You may need to contact those people. Um, you can't always rely on your client to do it. And you may need to even subpoena them at some point. And so you want to get all that information from your client. And if he doesn't know it, then you know we'll get it from your phone. We'll get your phone out of evidence, that kind of thing. But get all the contact information so we can identify who we need to talk to that might know something about this allegation. Another thing you might want to do is have some blank releases with you. Um, may need to get medical records depending on the facts of the case. It's just easier if you have them sign blank releases at the first meeting. If you never use them, fine, but it saves you a trip going back once you realize I need those. Um, all right, so one of the first things then after addressing bond uh, is what's called a probable cause determination or preliminary hearing. Now, they used to have preliminary hearings for all class one misdemeanors and higher in South Dakota, but Senate Bill 70 was passed a few years ago and kind of at the last minute they threw that in there to say, well, let's just get rid of preliminary hearings for misdemeanor offenses altogether. So now if you get appointed or if you're representing someone on a misdemeanor offense, like a DUI, first offense, there is no preliminary hearing. They will just uh, give you a trial date. They'll file an information saying this is the person's charge. Now, if you have a felony, which can be a burglary, which can be a DUI third or fourth, lots of different felonies that it could be, then you do have the right to a preliminary hearing. Preliminary hearing is a hearing short of a trial where the state has to put on evidence to show that there's probable cause that the offense was committed. They don't have to prove your client guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, not that level of proof, but just is there enough here to give probable cause that this happened and that your client is the one who likely committed the offense, <clears throat> enough to continue the case on towards a trial. Now that's got to happen. If your client is in custody, if they can't get out of custody, then by statute and law that preliminary hearing has to be within 15 days. If they can post bond and they get out of custody, then the state has 45 days in which to have that hearing. Now in some counties they have the preliminary hearing. You go in and generally at preliminary hearing, if you're having a preliminary hearing, you don't put on any evidence. It's not a hearing that you are going to win and get the case dismissed, okay, nine times out of ten. But it, what you want to do, it's a great opportunity for you to hear the, some of the state's evidence and to ask questions 
through cross-examination to pin down some of those witnesses as to their story so they can't change it later. Okay, and But generally at a preliminary hearing, you would not want to put on any evidence. Uh, you would want to save that for trial. You would not want to show your hand as to what your evidence is. One of the advantages uh, of being on the defense side is that the state has to give you all of their evidence. Your client is the accused. He's the one, he has due process rights, and he has the right to know what he's being charged with and what evidence they have against him. Furthermore, he has the right to any potentially exculpatory evidence. So if any witnesses have said, well, let's say it's a DUI charge and there was a witness who said, I don't, I don't think the driver was wearing a red shirt. I think the driver was wearing a white shirt and your client was wearing a red shirt. You're entitled to that statement. You're entitled to that witness. You're entitled to know that. On the other hand, if you have a witness who says, I think the driver was wearing a white shirt, you don't have any obligation to give that information to the state. You could, you may want to, you have, I guess it's a strategic choice. You might want to say, well, look, if I let you talk to the state, maybe they'll drop the case. But then again, maybe they won't. Maybe all you will have accomplished is letting them know what your evidence is and giving them a chance to figure out how to discredit that witness. So when those situations come up and you have to decide, do I show my cards or not, those are, those are a little bit tougher situations. Um, and maybe if you're not an experienced criminal defense lawyer, you ask someone who's done it more and say, well, what would you do here? How should I handle this? Um, Circling back around then to preliminary hearing. Preliminary hearing, the state's got to put on the evidence. You're not going to put on your witness that says this guy was wearing a white shirt, okay? Because the judge ultimately will say, well, there's some question here, but there's probable cause at least to bind it over for trial. So then all you've done is you've showed them your hand, and you don't want to do that. Now, I tell you all this about preliminary hearings, but also preliminary hearings don't happen that often. And the reason they don't happen that often is because our law allows for a grand jury process. Grand jury is something that prosecutors love. It's a prosecutorial tool. And what they do, it allows them to take six people off the street, put them in a room, call them the grand jury, and then they get to put on their evidence in front of those six people instead of at a preliminary hearing with a judge and a defense lawyer. So the judge isn't at the grand jury and you're not at the grand jury. It's a closed proceeding. You don't get to be there. Later, you can get a transcript and find out what was said because the testimony is given under oath. Uh, but it's very easy to get the grand jury then to hand down what's called an indictment. Indictment is another way of charging your client with a crime. Usually the process starts out, they're charged by a complaint that the state files that says, uh, you know, State of South Dakota versus John Smith uh, charged with burglary. Then your client has a right to a preliminary hearing, but instead of that preliminary hearing, most of the time the prosecutor doesn't want to let you ask questions to their witnesses, so they will take the case to grand jury. And then at the grand jury, they will put on their side of the story. The grand jury doesn't get to hear anything else. They don't hear from anyone even questioning both prosecutorial witnesses. So the grand jury almost always is somewhat of a rubber stamp, and they will just hand down the indictment. Uh, there's an old saying that a, a good prosecutor could get an indictment against a ham sandwich for doing something wrong, right? Um, so most of your cases are going to go that way. Now, sometimes there's a problem. Sometimes there's a problem, and the prosecutor says, darn it, I've got to have a preliminary hearing. I can't get, make the grand jury work because the officer can't come that day or whatever. Uh, and I, you know, we used to have preliminary hearings all the time, and now we don't have them anymore. But I did have one, I'd say, 18 months ago because there was some problem. And it was great because I got to ask all these questions. And I found out, you know, that this guy knew, was familiar with where the guns were and this guy wasn't, and it helped the case. So if you ever have the choice, which you probably won't, but um, if you have an opportunity to have a preliminary hearing, uh, take it. Uh, because most of the time it's just going to be grand jury. You'll get an indictment. Then you do want to request the transcript so you can at least tell what was said. Uh, 
but that's going to be about all you get out of that process. So then the case will be bound over for a trial date. Um, you need to file some pretrial motions. You need to make sure, number one, that you have everything from the state. So the first thing you do is look at what's called discovery. And, and I talked about this a little bit. Discovery means that you have a right to have all of the evidence that the state is going to use. So you can file a motion saying, give me the discovery. Or you can do just a, a written request. And I think we have in the materials a sample letter. And that's what I usually use. And it just requests everything that the state has, witness statements, audio tapes, video tapes, recordings. Um, the reason you use just the letter is that if you file the motion, then you stop the 180-day clock from running. The 180-day clock is the speedy trial rule. Every defendant has to be brought to trial within 180 days. Now, that time can be extended if, if for good cause, if the court finds good cause, or if, as a defense attorney, you ask for more time. If you say, judge, we need more time, and you file for a continuance, they're going to give you more time, but they're they're not going to count that intervening time period. And if you file any motions, any motion you file, even a routine motion, will stop that 180-day clock. So most of the time, if you can avoid filing that discovery motion and can just get what you want through the letter, just use the letter. Because then you don't compromise your client's right to a speedy trial. If you have to use the motion, there's a couple of situations you would want to use the motion. One would be if it was a major case. If your client's charged with a, a manslaughter or a homicide or something of that nature, just go ahead and file the motion. Speedy trial is, is not really your main concern, and you want to make sure you have built an adequate record so that if you ever had to appeal something, there's a court order that says what they had to give you. And the second time would be if the state just isn't cooperating. If they're just not giving you what they're supposed to give you, for some reason you can't get the video and you've tried a couple of times and they just, they're giving you excuses or whatever, file the motion, set it for hearing. Uh, the judge is going to be very, uh, I don't want to say liberal, but he's going to be inclined in your favor to give your client everything that he's entitled to. And, and they will look, and the state attorneys hate this. They hate being in court. And you say, Judge, I don't have everything. I've asked and I don't have everything. And then the judge turns to say, well, why doesn't he have everything? Well, uh, then they start scrambling around and looking through their file and they hate it. Okay, So file the motion if you have to. If you file a motion, be sure to get a written order granting the motion or denying the motion. Usually it's going to be granted. The 180 is stopped until you get that order filed. Even if you went to court and the judge said in court, I'll, I'll allow that and state you need to provide that, until you get that written order, you're still, you've still stopped the speedy trial 180 clock. So you want to get that order done because that starts the time running again, and that puts pressure on the state. They've got to get your guy done on time. Uh, there are other motions that you may want to file. Uh, a lot of Good issues in criminal defense you can file through a motion to suppress. Motions to suppress are based upon usually a couple different constitutional rights, the Fourth Amendment, uh, protection against unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, the right to counsel, uh, the right against self-incrimination. depends on the facts of your case. Um, one of the first things that you need to do before you decide, do I file a motion to suppress, you need to watch the video. Uh, you've got to get the video. In Sioux Falls, you can send this discovery letter that says, give me the video, and they don't give you the video. And you have to make a separate request for some reason for the video. But when you send that separate request, then you will get the video. And you need to watch the video because your client might not remember accurately uh, for one thing. 
I just had a client I met with today who was charged with a overdriving road conditions, a real serious offense. He was an old guy, um, 89 years old, and he kind of told me different stories about what happened. I think he didn't really remember very accurately. So I got the video, which is taken from the police car uh, camera on the dashboard, and the officers will wear a microphone on their uniform. So you can hear the conversations that the officer is involved in. And you got to take notes, you know, if, if necessary. But you watch the video, see what happens. A lot of times it is different. So I set him up. I said, here, watch the video. And after watching the video, you know, he said, boy, I, I guess I, I really was out of it. He didn't, he, his memory was completely different than what the video showed him. And I think this type of evidence is just going to become more and more common. I'm reading about body cameras that they're, they don't do it yet, at least in Sioux Falls, but I think they do it some other places where they're going to be, officers are going to be wearing body cameras. So more of our job is going to be watching those videos. And uh, you really have to watch the whole thing and listen to the whole thing because you'll get a police report that says, this is what happened. And your client will say, well, pretty much what happened. I don't really remember. You watch the video. There can be a whole nother set of facts in there. An example, um, I had a case where the officer, they pulled the, pulled the car over for some reason, running a stop sign or something, and they wanted to search the car. And the officer said, in the report, he said, I smelled the odor of marijuana, and we asked him to step out, and we searched the car based upon the odor of marijuana. Okay, read the report. Sounds fine. It was hot in the car. Watch the video. On the video, the first officer uh, is talking to a cover, another cover officer who comes up. And two of them are talking. And the defendants and people are still in the, in the car. And you can't see them, but you can hear them. And one of them says, well, did you smell anything? And the second guy says, eh, I have a cold. I can't smell shit. Okay, well, he's the guy who wrote in his report, I smelled marijuana. So cops are people, they're going to they're gonna lie like anyone else. I'm not up here to say police are, are bad or that they lie habitually or anything like that. Most of the time, they do their job and they do it pretty well. Um, but as a defense attorney, your job is to make sure that they do that all of the time. because. That's certainly not the case. They will bend the rules. If they think a guy's guilty, and, and they're not lawyers, they, they think they know the law, and a lot of times they know the law, and sometimes they don't. And that's when you've got to catch them. And you've got to say, eh, you didn't do that quite right. And it makes them mad, uh, but that's your job. And if they're going to lie, you certainly need to call them out on it. So in this particular case, the officer was up there testifying. And we confronted him with what he said on the video. And he backpedaled and he said, well, I, I smell the faint odor. You know, he tried to warm his way out of it, but it didn't work. Everybody knew what had happened there. Um, different kinds of suppression issues. One is going to be the stop of a vehicle. They did the, a lot of crimes are going to be you know, either DUIs or they found some drugs in a vehicle. But they've got to have reasonable suspicion before they can stop that vehicle. And you need to look at the video. You need to read the reports. Sometimes you may have to go out to where it happened, depending on if they're talking about there was a, you know, a sign here or there, and figure out, did they have reasonable suspicion? Uh, example I guess I could give you. Let's see. I had a case up in Brookings where the officer said, Stop the vehicle. He had a cracked windshield. Okay. Um, you got to pull the statute. The statute says uh, you, you can't have a crack in your windshield that obstructs your vision or obstructs the driver's vision. And then you get pictures of the, of the windshield. And there's a crack. There is a crack, but it's all the way along the bottom, basically right by the dashboard. In no way does it obstruct the driver's vision. And the officer can see it. 
but it's not illegal. And if it's not illegal, then you don't have reasonable suspicion that a crime is taking place. That's what the reasonable suspicion is. The officer's got a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime is taking place. So what is the crime in this case? It was supposed to be driving with a broken windshield or a cracked windshield. So you have a hearing and you put all that out there for the judge. And the judge, in this case, he looked at it and said it did not obstruct the vision. So I'm, I'm not going to find that this was a constitutionally permissible stop. Then you, if the stop is thrown out, then everything that comes subsequent to that, the search of the vehicle, the search of the people in the vehicle, statements they may have made, that's all going to be fruit of the poisonous tree. It all relates back to the constitutional illegality. If not for that illegality, none of that other evidence would have been discovered most of the time. So if you can get the stop challenged uh, successfully, that can be a great benefit to your client. Um, another case I just had, uh, cops are coming to serve a search warrant on a house, drug house. My client uh, is sitting in a van in the driveway. Cops are coming across the street. She sees the police are coming. She backs out and drives away. Now the warrant says we're going to search all persons uh, and vehicles present at the time of execution of the warrant. Well, they drive away, so the cops call their cover officer and they end up pulling them over about three blocks away and they search them there. Well, um, when you get into the research and the case law, you find out that that's not permissible. And uh, there's a case, I think it was a Bailey case, uh, that says it's got to be within a certain amount of, of radius of the home. And so you really have to look in suppression issues, it's break it down into slices of time. Okay. At this moment, what did they know and what evidence was there? Now, they may develop more evidence on a subsequent moment, but they have to be able to justify it every step of the way. Okay, so at the moment of the, that the car was stopped, that's what you have to focus on. Uh, now, sometimes you know, you're going you're gonna to win the battle. I had a case down in Kansas. When I was practicing down there, cops found uh, 133 pounds of pot in a van. And my client, uh, they pulled him over and he had a bunch of fast food wrappers and things like that. And they said that was indicated, indicative that he was uh, a drug mule and was driving long distances. And they asked him if he could search the, the van, if they could search the van. And he said, no can't search the van. Well, why not? I said, well, that's, that's my right, isn't it? And they're going to search it anyway. Okay, So they search it anyway. But when we looked at it on appeal, um, we said, what? You didn't have any, any reason, reasonable, uh, any probable cause to search, rather. You didn't get a warrant to search. And you didn't consent to the search. So we threw out the evidence. Now they're going to search anyway because, like in this case, they searched, they got 133 pounds of pot, they're taking pictures by all the pot, you know, they get it all off the streets, the guy gets arrested, he's got to hire a lawyer, he's got to sit in jail for a while, even if he ultimately beats uh, the, the charge because the evidence is thrown out, they still are happy with it. They didn't get their conviction, but they he got some measure of consequence and they got all those drugs off the street. So the exclusionary rule, which is you know, evidence has to be kept out that was a product of a, a bad search or fruit of the poisonous tree, it's not a sufficient deterrent always to law enforcement. They're going to search anyway. <clears throat> and if they search and they don't find anything, what's the harm? Right? You trample over someone's constitutional rights. I stop you because you're black, for example. Stop you. Search the car. We don't find anything. We let you go. What's the person's remedy? Are you going to file a lawsuit against the city? 
It's not going to get anywhere. There's no criminal case, so there's no place to complain about the search. So these things are going to keep happening. You're going to get bad stops. You're going to get bad searches. All you can do is, is fight against them the best you can. Um, third category is probably statements that your client made. And again, you've got to watch the video. You can't rely on what the police report says. That's prepared by the officer. The officer and the state's attorney work hand in hand. They are both considered law enforcement. So you can't necessarily trust that the officer is going to put everything in that report that you might want in there, even if it's accurate. Um, he's going to write his report with a little bit of a slant to try to help his state's attorney get the conviction. So you need to watch the video. You need to take detailed notes. Um, and sometimes you might have to file a motion to say, I want some of the statements in this video to be redacted and kept out of evidence. I had a case recently with a, a young guy who was charged with uh, sexual contact with a child at a daycare. Okay? And he said he didn't do it. And then he, brought, he went in for an interview. And the detective uh, said, well, I know you did it. I just want to know why. And he said, no, I, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. And every time he tried to say, I, really, I didn't do this, the detective would cut him off and say, well, I did. my investigation clearly shows that you did this. I just want to know why. And I wrote this down. I'm taking notes. I wrote that down about 40 times. That's all he said through the interview over and over and over. Now, how would that sound if it were played in front of a jury? You've got the detective basically testifying to the jury my investigation shows you clearly did this. That's not a fair trial for your client. Okay, number one, the detective is a fact witness only. He can testify about what he has observed, what statements were made to him. He can't give an ultimate conclusion that your client is guilty or not guilty. That is the jury's job. Or if you're having a court trial, it's the judge's job. And he knows that. They know that. Yet they're going to conduct that interview that way anyway. So you have to file a motion and go through, at, you know, at hour one, minute 12, 30 seconds, he said this. And that's got to be taken out. And it can be kind of painstaking work when they conduct their interviews that way. Um, but what can you do? Uh, Sometimes, too, what you want to look for in those videos is whether your client requested an attorney. Okay. Uh, the law says if your client unequivocally requests counsel, that the state can no longer question them. Okay. They have to stop questioning them, can't seek to elicit any other incriminating information. So what happens is your client will say something like, maybe I should have a lawyer. Or ask the detective, do you think I should have a lawyer? Those are going to be equivocal statements. Those aren't going to be enough to trigger the constitutional protection. But sometimes they will say things like, I want an attorney. That's unequivocal. Anything they say after that is grounds to be suppressed. So if you watch that video, and on the police report, it might just say, we discussed an attorney, or he mentioned an attorney. You got to watch the video and see exactly what did your client say. Okay? If he says unequivocally, I want an attorney, then everything after that is fair game to be thrown out. And officers are pretty good about that because they know the rules. But sometimes they'll, they'll say, okay, I understand you want an attorney, but, and then they'll keep talking. And then your client might. And the conversation continues. So sometimes they don't honor it. You really need to, need to be vigilant about that. Uh, let's see. Motions to dismiss. There are some statutory grounds in that statute that cited what you can ask that a case be dismissed. This rarely, if ever, happens. Um, I should probably just take that out of this outline. Uh, but point two, I guess, is relevant. A lot of people will say, well, there's no evidence. Can't you just get this thrown out? There's no evidence? No, you can't file a motion to say, dismiss the case for lack of evidence. 
That's the ultimate question that you would decide at a trial. There's not enough evidence. And at a preliminary hearing, there has to be some evidence, probable cause threshold. But you can't file a motion to say, Judge, there isn't enough evidence to throw this out. That's just not the way it works. The other thing that your every client will ask you is, well, they didn't read me my rights. Okay. As you guys probably know, um, you only need to be read your rights if it's a custodial interrogation. So your client's got to be in custody, which can be a question sometimes, you know, well, they weren't in custody, but they were handcuffed and sitting in a chair. Yeah, that's in custody. Or the cop ordered them out of the car and ordered them to sit there on the curb and they weren't free to leave. So whether or not they're in custody is an interesting question that you got to look at. Um, but a lot of the times it's, you know, I wasn't in custody or I did, they didn't read me my rights. Did they ask you any questions? No. Well, then what are we talking about? Because <laughs> the remedy for that is that your answers, we could keep those out of court. But if they didn't ask you any questions and there was no interrogation, then it doesn't matter. They don't have to read your rights. But you're going to have to answer that to all of your clients because they all watch TV and they know that they need to have your rights read to you. Okay, so after you go through your different motions and your pretrial preparation, you reviewed the discovery, you got your client's side of the story, you kind of have an idea where do we stand. Now, do we have a, any defense here? Now, a lot of times your client is charged with a crime because he's guilty of that crime. And you may not have much of a defense, if any. But sometimes you might have one, or sometimes it, he may be overcharged. Okay? Um, now, there's different levels of there's grand theft and petty theft. Um, there's reckless driving and careless driving. There's assault or disorderly conduct. The state might have charged him with the higher offense, and he's only guilty of the lesser offense. So while you may not have, you know, he still did something wrong, you might have a defense to the charge. Say, okay, he did something wrong, but he didn't do that. So anyway, you figure out where do you stand. And I would say that uh, one of the nice things about practicing in South Dakota is we have a smaller bar, and attorneys are very willing to talk over cases with you, answer questions. I know there's a mentor program. I don't know if any of you will take advantage of that. Um, so whether you have a mentor formally like that or you sort of develop one through associations with other attorneys, if you have a case that you're a little iffy about, I really encourage you to call an older attorney and say, hey, can I run this by you? This, you know, I've got this guy. This is what the deal is. And just get their, you know, get their input. It can really help um, in looking at your case maybe a little bit of a different way. But what will happen then is you'll have a plea bargain offer uh, from the state. Now, there's two ways to resolve a criminal case. One is by a plea bargain where you go in and you say, okay, we'll plead guilty to this, and this is what the sentence will be. The second is by a trial. We say, we couldn't agree, so judge or jury, we're asking you to decide the case. The third way is, of course, if the state dismisses the charges. And as a defense attorney, that's great. We love that. We don't have any real control over that. Um, if door number three is an option, dismissal, we almost always are going to take that. But most of the time, we're choosing between door one and two. Um, so I always tell my clients, look, I'm going to prepare on both fronts. I'm going to prepare for trial. I want, I'm going to get our defense together. I'm going to know what that is. How are we going to make that defense? But at the same time, I'm going to pursue the best possible plea bargain. And then you, your client gets to make that choice. So you talk to your client and you say, these are our chances at trial, good, bad, whatever they might be. And this is the plea bargain that we have on the table and what I think will happen there. You decide what you want to do. I'll give you my recommendation. I might recommend trial or I might recommend the plea bargain. But whatever you, the client wants to do, I will zealously advocate for you whatever choice you make because it's their case, it's their life, they're the ones that have to serve the time if there's time to be served. They're the ones that have to take the risk of a trial if they decide to go to trial. So that is their decision, what they want to do. Um, 
I also usually tell clients, and different people have different approaches, I usually say, look, if we're facing a felony charge, we don't want to be sitting at the defense table in a felony trial unless there's no other good option. Because when you go to trial, the jury is a variable. It's a little bit of a roll of the dice. Um, I've had cases where my client was charged with distribution of marijuana, four big bags of marijuana found in the basement. And we presented evidence that it was the girlfriend's marijuana. She was the drug dealer. And the jury found him not guilty of possession of marijuana with intent to distribute, but found him guilty of possession of marijuana. That doesn't make any sense. If this was not a personal use amount. Either you possessed it because you were going to sell it, or you didn't possess it. So juries will do crazy things, and you don't have any control over that. And you have to keep that in mind when you're advising your client. If we go to trial, I think we can prove this, but there's going to be two sides to the story in there. There's going to be a prosecutor. They're going to be giving their evidence and their side of the story, and it's a risk. And so some of this is just measuring risk. And, you, and I'm risk averse. That's sort of my philosophy is I don't want my client to take on any more risk than they have to. Uh, and I think that's a good philosophy. Um, clients get to make those, that decision. They also get to decide at a trial whether to testify or not. Um, you can say, I don't think you should testify, but if they really want to, they get to testify. You get to make other decisions like who to call as a witness, what questions to ask. They may want you to ask about certain things and you know that that's not helping them and, or that it's not relevant or that the judge isn't going to let you. And so you, you get to decide those things. Um, but you'll have a, an offer from the state's attorney. Now, so they might say, okay, um, we want your guy to plead guilty to burglary, cap of 10 years in prison. Well, okay, then you... Take that to your client. You're obligated to communicate all offers to your client. Your client might not like that offer. It's not a very good offer, maybe. But you have to communicate it to them. And then you look at, okay, look at a parole chart. How much of that will you actually serve before you get paroled? So you can advise them of that. What do you think the judge is going to do? Uh, you know, the, a cap means a judge could give anywhere from 10 years to zero. So you might say, well, look, I think the judge is going to give you five. And then you, you look at the parole chart, you're going to serve two and a half. So you, you make it real for them, figure out um, what's likely to happen, but advise them of worst case and best case scenarios. And also keep in mind, it's like any other negotiation. The prosecutor probably isn't leading with his best offer. You know, if you go buy a car and it says $20,000, you know you can probably get them to come down some. You're probably not going to get it for 10000 but you might be able to get it for seventeen five. And so never hesitate to push the prosecutor a little bit to say, well, you know, I would do a cap of, I would do a cap of seven. I won't do 10, but I would do seven. And, and just kind of see where you can get. You don't want to draw a line in the sand. You don't want to say, absolutely not, I'm never going to do that. And then later a client says, I guess we better take the cap of 10. Doesn't really hurt your client but it hurts you. You've got your credibility with the, the state's attorney's office. They need to know that when you are negotiating with them, that you mean what you say. So if you say, nope, I'm not doing that, um, then you need to mean that. And if you make a different offer and they accept it, you need to be able to, you can't say, I'll do cap of five. And then they say, okay. And then your client says, I'm not doing that. You say, well, actually, we can't do that. So you've got to maintain your credibility, make sure to deal with them on a, on a level playing field and in good faith. Um, if you don't like the offer you have and you want a better one, then sometimes you have to give them a better fact. They may not know some mitigating fact about your case. And so they may not know, for example, simple example, they may not know that your client has gone through drug treatment. So you say, look, you want him to do 60 days in jail on this, but he went through treatment and he did really well. And here's his treatment report. Doesn't that count for something? Shouldn't, you know, why don't you give me 30 days on this instead? And you give them an additional fact like that and maybe you get a better offer. Um, 
The other thing is over time, you got to get to know your prosecutor. Okay? Certain prosecutors are what I like to call uh, paper tigers. If you try to negotiate with them by email and you maybe argue a little bit about your case, you just get you know, a ferocious response. Absolutely not. Your client, blah, 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 blah. But that same prosecutor, if you see him in the courthouse and you talk to him, you say, hey, you know, come on, my, I got, he's a pretty good guy. Here's what I can do. What about this? We don't want to spend, we don't want to spend three days trying this. You know, you get, you may get different results. And I can think of one prosecutor in particular, I will never email because I know what type of responses I get. So I'll just always either call him or, you know, see him at the courthouse at, at one of our court dates and pull him aside and say, hey, let's, got a minute, let's talk about this. So you've got to know your prosecutor. And some, some prosecutor, I mean, they're all different. They're all people like you and I just doing a job. But for some, it's really a, a calling. Some are very righteous and believe deeply in what they're doing. And uh, for some, it's more, oh, this is what I do, and I'm going to try to do the best job that I can. Um, so you kind of got to get to know them. And if you're having trouble with a prosecutor, again, talk to the other defense lawyers. Say, hey, I, you know, I'm dealing with so-and-so here, and I just can't get anywhere with them. What, what, what's your take on this? And a defense lawyer might say, oh, yeah, they hate that kind of thing. Or you know, you'll get some input. You'll get some feedback. Um, and sometimes you don't get anywhere. Sometimes you try and try and try. You don't get anywhere. Um, what they don't like is to be constantly badgered with the same thing. You go to them and your client's charged with assault and you want them to reduce it to disorderly conduct. They say no. Don't just call them the next week and with the same thing. Hey, will you I already said no to that. I'm not going to do that. Give it some time. Have a different fact. Say, hey, I know you didn't want to do this before, but you know, listen to this. This is what else has happened. This is why I want you to do this. And just kind of see what else you can finagle out of them, so to speak. Um, open plea. An open plea is when your client goes in, uh, let's say it's a class one misdemeanor, the maximum penalty is a year in jail. If you have a plea agreement, you're coming in and you're saying, we're going to plead guilty to uh, petty theft, cap of 10 days. It means a judge can give them anywhere from 10 days to zero of actual jail time. And then they can always suspend additional time. So the sentence might be 180 days in jail, 170 days suspended. So out of that 180, you're going to serve 10. The other 170 are going to be suspended on conditions like no like offenses for one year, pay your fines and costs, things like that. Sometimes, though, it's better to go in with an open plea. Let's say you're uh, in there on a theft, and the prosecutor really has it out for your guy for whatever reason. Maybe he had to let him off of a charge last year, and he remembers that, and he just thinks your guy's a bad guy. Maybe your guy is a bad guy. Um, and he says, I want, I want uh, 180 days on this. Well, you look at it and you think, well, I don't think the judge would give him 180 days. So you can go in with what's called an open plea, where you're just saying, judge, you can give him whatever you want out of the zero to 365 days. It's up to you. I'm going to make my argument. You can give him whatever you want. You risk giving your client more time if the, if the judge sees it the wrong way. But what you avoid is putting a bad number in the judge's head. Okay, if you go in and say, judge, we agreed to the cap of 180. I'm asking for zero. And the state's asking for 180. What is the judge going to do? The judge is going to think, well, that's my range here, zero to 180. State's asking for this. They, they agreed and pled to that. I'm going to give 180 or I'm going to give maybe 90, uh, something in between those. You're not likely to get zero or suspended jail. So if you think the prosecutor's offer is really unreasonable and you know the judge and you have prior experience with the judge and you think, you know, this judge isn't going to do that, then don't put that bad number in the judge's head. You, it, may, it may be a case where you say, I'd rather just plead open than put this number in there. You, know? you need to talk to your client about that because they are taking additional risk. But sometimes it's better, you get a better result. Um, 
And then yes, avoid last minute deals. Uh, you don't want to show up at the time of the plea and say, hey, can we, can we make this better? Okay, can we, instead of Kappa 20, can we do Kappa 10? Um, it's real easy for the prosecutor just to say no, because they know you're probably going to take the deal that's on the table. So don't do it at the last minute. And also, they're busy. They're in court. they got a stack of files. What are they going to do? Dig into the facts of the case right then and there when the judge is about to take the bench? No. They're going to say, no, we're going to stay with what we have, and then you're going to be stuck. So if you want to make a, a counter offer to them or make another pitch to them, don't do it at the very last minute because they're just going to say no out of time considerations, if nothing else. So get to them, get to them early and, and work on them to try to get the best outcome for your client. And that is something that I, I will say to the client is, look, I can't get you out of this a lot of times. You, you're not some you know, great defense attorneys aren't, oh, we're going to, it's going to be an acquittal on every case. Most of the time your clients have done something wrong or they wouldn't have been arrested and they wouldn't have been charged. And that's okay. Um, and if you can't find some issue like a suppression issue or something else to really, you know, get the case dismissed or vastly reduced, then what is your job? Well, first, your job is to look for all those things, make sure that none of their rights were violated. But in some cases, they weren't. Police had a good reason to pull them over. Police had a good reason to search. Uh, and the evidence was found in your client's pocket. You know, he's got a bag of meth in his pocket. You don't have a lot to go on, but your role is still very important. What you're going to do, number one, is you're going to guide your client through the process. You're going to tell them, hey, this is what we're doing next. This is how it's going to go. What I found is that clients really don't like uncertainty. And what I mean by that is they know they did something wrong. They know there's punishment coming, but they don't know when or how much. And that makes it very difficult for them to deal with. So even if the answer isn't a great answer, even if you say, yeah, looks like we're going to get five years on this, at least they know because they're facing up to 25 maybe. So if you can guide them through the process and eliminate uncertainty, you want to know before you go into the courtroom what's going to happen, where you've already worked out what you can, you've already talked to your client, you have a very good idea what the judge is going to do, and you can tell your client beforehand, this is what's going to happen. We're going to go in, the judge is going to tell you what your rights are, we're going to change our plea, there's going to be a delay in sentencing, we're going to come back, it's going to be a pre-sentence report. You can go through the process with them and tell them, and this is what you can reasonably expect. They will think you're a great lawyer, even though all you did was kind of guide them through everything and keep them informed. But that's half of your job sometimes, is keep them informed and eliminate that uncertainty. Now, if you do have to go to trial, and sometimes it calls for it, uh, you need to be prepared. And what is the saying? Failure to prepare is to prepare to fail, something like that. But it really is true, especially with trial, um, you need to have all of your ducks in a row, so to speak. And I think I have a list here of potential things you want to do. And these are kind of headings for your trial notebook. And what I usually do is I get a binder and I start putting stuff in the binder under those headings and say, okay, where are we going to start? We're going to start with selecting the jury uh, with voir dire. And that is a very important part of the trial. It's not a part that I particularly love myself, um, but it's very important. The key to voir dire is to get the panel talking. Okay, My father was on a jury panel once, and I told him, well, you want to get picked for the jury, here's the secret. Don't say much. Okay, And he, he didn't say much, and he got on the jury. He told me, oh, you were right. He said, I know I was right. Because if you don't, if you say a lot, then either the state or the defense is going to conclude, I don't like that person. So if you say all great things for the prosecution, then the defense is going to strike you. If you say things, you know, defense oriented, the state's going to strike you. So what you end up with is the 12 people who didn't say very much. So you don't know very much about that jury. Now, 
if in jury selection you can get them all talking, I mean, the government can't strike them all, right? So if you can get them all talking, then you will you will know a little bit more about the 12 that end up on your panel. And part of that is developing your theme of the case. And I don't know, maybe you guys have a whole class on this. I don't know. Um, but if, you're, if your theme is that, um, let's say your guy's charged with rape, uh, and the theme is that the person was, the, the charge is that the person was too intoxicated uh, to consent. And your evidence is, well, actually, this person, and the person's saying, I don't remember anything that happened. So your theme might be, hey, blacked out is different than passed out. Okay, she doesn't remember. So she was blacked out. She wasn't passed out. She was conscious. She was doing stuff. She was at a party. And eventually these two had consensual sex. But your theme is blacked out is different than passed out. Right? So you may want to talk to the jury about anybody ever been blacked out where they couldn't remember what they what happened to them the next day? Anybody ever, and you'll get a show of hands, you go into it with each one of them. I had a case where my client was charged with a DUI, she woke up in her car uh, in a parking lot of like a warehouse. Her and her friend, neither one of them could remember what happened. And there was like, they'd been to Taco John's because there was Taco John's in the car, and there was nacho cheese on the window, and they didn't know what happened. But when the police found him there, they just tested my client's blood alcohol. And she was over the limit, so charged her with DUI. And she says, "I don't, you know, I think I got roofied. I think I somebody gave me a, a date rape drug. Otherwise, why, why can't I remember anything that happened?" So we went to trial, and I got an expert to talk about potential date rape drugs and how, you know, whether that's consistent with her story, and it was. And, but in jury selection, I said, does anybody have any experience with, uh, I think it's called GHB or what's called the date rape drug? Thinking, no one's going to answer. Yes. Three quarters of the panel raised their hands. I couldn't believe it. And it wasn't necessarily that they had, but they had knew somebody who this had happened to or something like that. So don't be afraid to explore the theme of your case, because that was going to be my defense. And so I threw it out there, and we talked about that for a good 45 minutes because everybody raised their hand. And I would have bet my left arm that that wasn't the case. So that definitely helped. And yes, the jury found her not guilty. So going back then, that's the first part of your trial notebook, jury selection. Try to advance your themes there. Try to get them talking. Probably the second most important part of your trial is your ability to cross-examine the witness. You guys have a class on that? You've all taken that class? Okay. That's, you know, state's attorney, their job is to put the cop up there and say, well, what happened next, officer? And what happened next? I mean, they just basically tell the story. But you get to cross-examine. Cross-examination is where you get to really score some points and have a lot of fun. That's the best part of the trial. But a good cross-examination has to be, you have to have a plan. You can't just go into it and say, well, I hope she says something that I can get her on. And you've got to have a plan. And the plan revolves around some fact that you know you can pin them down on. Maybe they testified to it at grand jury. Maybe they testified that, you know, I came in the front door um, and it was 10 o'clock. Okay, they've said that under oath. They say anything different, you know, we've got them. And you can establish it from the front door, they couldn't see the kitchen. So then you can say, well, you, could, you did, couldn't see the kitchen when you walked in, could you? Oh, yes, I could. Oh, you could. So you can, you know, you, but you've got to start with a fact that you know they can't deny. Now, I had a case, uh, actually, I guess that's the case I referred to earlier with uh, the four big bags of marijuana. And we were trying to say that this marijuana belonged to the girlfriend. Um, well, I had found on her Facebook account a picture of her sitting on kind of in front of her bed 
stacks of money all spread out on her bed, and she's kind of sitting there like this with some gang signs and whatnot. Okay, and everyone who looks at this picture thinks, well, that's drug money, right? So I've got, and the state's attorney doesn't know about this picture, so I blow this picture up. I'm going to bring in a nice big picture for everyone to see. And, but I'm thinking, well, geez, you know, I got I to gotta be able to pin her down. So early in my examination, I ask her, where do you work? Oh, I, she, I work at a, you know, cleaning rooms at this hotel. Okay, and how much money do you make there? I make 10 bucks an hour, okay? That's full time, okay? And you have kids, you have four kids. Because I want to establish that this is not, she does, she's not rich, right? She doesn't have extra money. Because I know later I'm going to say, where'd this money come from? And I don't want her to be able to say, oh, I, I work for a living. That's my, no, you make 10 bucks an hour, you know, okay? So you do things like that. I had her court appointed attorney application, and that said, you know, what her income was, and that she didn't have any money in the bank, signed under oath. So you lay the groundwork early with that. And then, you know, you get to the finally the point where you say, and you're saying you didn't have anything to do with these drugs, right? You claim these drugs all belong to my client. And you bring out the picture and you say, Is this you on this sitting on the bed in front of all the money? This was off of your Facebook account, wasn't it? And she knows you've got her now. And so I asked her, and you don't ever want to ask open-ended questions. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly how I asked it, but I think I said, that's drug money, isn't it? No, that's my tax return. I said, okay, <laughs> tax return. So then you want to play. Okay, let's play. You worked at so-and-so. You got a tax return. Did they send that to you in cash? No. They sent you a check, didn't they? So you want this jury to believe that you took your tax return check, you took it to the bank and cashed it, right? And now she has to follow along because she's already said it was her tax return. Yeah. And you asked the banker to give you that tax return back in fives and tens and twenties, right? And then you took that and you carefully arranged it on your bed in different stacks. And then you posed in front of it and flashed a gang sign and took a picture and put it on Facebook to show all of your gang buddies how much you got back for your tax return, right? <laughs> yeah. So she looked terrible, but what could she do? So cross-examination, very fun, I think, and, and critical to your case. Nevertheless, they still found my client guilty of possessing it, which I don't understand. Um, subpoenas. You've got to subpoena your witnesses. You cannot rely on the prosecutor to do that. You may look at a police report, you may even talk to the prosecutor and say, well, is this officer going to testify? Because there may be something in his report that helps your client. Oh, yeah, I want to ask him about these things in his report. And they may say, oh, yeah, yeah, he'll be there. Okay, well, what if he's not there? What if the uh, prosecutor at the last minute decides, I don't like some of the stuff in that report. Officer Johnson, you just go home. We'll, we've got what we need. You're left holding the bag. Okay, you have to. If you need him, you subpoena him. Even if both sides subpoena him, fine. But your your job is to protect your client and your client's ability to get that positive evidence from that officer. I had a, a colleague who learned that lesson the hard way, um, where somebody was called by the state to testify. And at least was going to be, and he saw them sitting out in the hall, you know, on a break in the trial. He saw, okay, Officer Johnson's here. I know he's here. He's going to be on next. Went back in. State finished with their witness. Judge says, State, any more witnesses? No, Your Honor. State rests. And my friend just kind of looked, thought, oh, what about Officer Johnson? I, he's the guy, you know, I'm going to get this evidence from. Says to the prosecutor, what about, what about officer? We released him from a subpoena. We decided we didn't need him. It's an adversarial system. Okay, You can't trust them, even if you're friends with them. You know, and I'm friends with prosecutors, and they're young professionals your age. You have a beer with them later, but you can't trust them to follow what they need to do to protect your client. Their job is not to protect your client. It's the opposite. And then, you know, in that situation, my my colleague said, "Judge, I, you know, what about so? Did you subpoena him? 
No? Well, that's your problem. Okay? So always, always, always subpoena every witness that you want there for any reason, even if it's a cop and a state witness. Um, motions in limine, I, we talked about that a little bit. You know, if you've got uh, things that you need redacted or kept out, you need to file motions to that effect, like that video. Um, de detectives will do that constantly. Uh, other acts evidence is another matter. Uh, prosecutors will know about something your client did that maybe wasn't charged as a crime. It doesn't make them look very good. They'll want to bring that in. You've got to file a motion to keep that out and have a pretrial hearing. Um, that's very important. And then once you're prepared, you know, you go through the trial. I never advise scripting out questions because I think it limits you. You need to listen to the evidence and be able to think on your feet and scratch out some questions based on that. I do think for a good cross-examination, you can have a few bullet points to so make sure you hit those. But, it, you know, I've been in cases where you see people have every question typed out. It, it actually backfires a little bit because you need to be able to think on your feet. Listen to the answer. I mean, the example I gave you with the tax return, that's not a question you would have typed out because you didn't know she was going to say that. Okay? You've got to be able to think on your feet a little bit. Don't type everything out. Um, you know, you, you're opening and closing. You, you don't want to have those typed out. Either. You want to just have, as the trial develops, you want to write down, I need to make sure I talk about this, talk about this, talk about that. Then you get up there and argue the case, and um, hopefully you get the right result. If you don't, uh, and your client is found guilty, or if you pled guilty, then you're going to go to sentencing. Again, the key to sentencing, number one, is to eliminate that uncertainty for your client. Tell them what they can expect. They will appreciate that. Um, you can submit materials to the court in advance. So if you have treatment reports, if you have letters of uh, support or uh, letters of character, so to speak, saying your client's a good guy, you want to give those to the court. If you just give them to the court at the time of sentencing, they may not have time to read them, or they may, they'll say on the record they read them, but they've already kind of got their mind made up what they're going to do. If you give them to the judge beforehand, then as they're reading this file and preparing for the case, they'll read that, they'll digest that information. It's much more likely to have a positive impact than if you just show up with it. Okay, so get it to the judge beforehand so they can do that. And then you want to be realistic in your argument. Okay, you're, you're the defense attorney. Your client has usually done something wrong and they've screwed up. Um, and if you know the judge is wanting to give them some time, Let's say you're in there and it's a cap of 60 days. Um, you think, ah, the judge is probably going to give them 30, but my client wants me to ask for zero. If you go in there and ask for zero, you kind of lose your credibility with the judge. You know, let's say that this is a somewhat aggravated case where for, it's a certainty your client is going to get some amount of time. If you go in there and ask for zero, you're not helping your client, you're not helping yourself. Uh, and the judge, you know, they're going to see you all the time. Pretty soon they'll start tuning you out because you always just take an unreasonable position. Uh, that applies to prosecutors, too. There was a prosecutor in juvenile court for many years who every kid that came in there, she would tell the judge, this kid's out of control. Well, not every kid is going to be out of control. And pretty soon the judges start realizing, you know, I'm not listening to her because she says that about every kid. <clears throat> so you need to be realistic. And give them an alternative. Give them something that they can sign off on and feel okay about. So if they want to give your client some time, say, okay, judge, but why don't you give him a week and then let him do some time on an electronic monitor. Uh, that allows him to be home with his children. That's very important. Um, it allows him to keep his job. Give them an alternative to, that can still lead to the most favorable outcome for your client under the circumstances. Your client, sometimes they're just going to have to pay the penalty. Uh, but I will say the environment there um, with the passage of Senate Bill 70 is that incarcerations are going down. It used to be if you had a guy on a DUI third, um, they were going to get 90 days. Uh, one judge always gave 120 days, okay, three, four months in jail with work release. Now they've passed that criminal reform and now, a lot of times, you can go in on a third offense and it's suspended. 
Okay, so you're going to get a year on a scram monitor, an alcohol monitor, but you aren't going to serve the jail time that you previously did. Uh, I will always too if I've got a case in a jurisdiction that I don't go to a lot. Like I've got one over in uh, Elk Point. Now, well, you call the local guy down there and say, hey, what is this judge going to do on this case? You know, I've got a DUI second offense. First offense was two years ago, whatever the example might be. They'll tell you, now oh, she'll probably give them 10 days. Okay. Then you can tell your client, well, oh, in my experience, she's going to give you about 10 days. You, know, you sound wise, even though it wasn't really you. But it has become you because you found out and you're giving them good advice. Um, so always call, if you're going somewhere else, call the local guys and just pick their brain on it. Um, if you lose a trial, you've got a right to appeal. You need to advise your client of that. Sometimes there's nothing to appeal, but you got to tell them that anyway. And then you can kind of tell them you don't have anything or, yeah, I think the mistakes were made. We should appeal. Um, if they plead guilty, there's nothing to appeal. Um, if you lose a trial, there is something to appeal because there could be mistakes at the trial. In the federal system, you can preserve issues for appeal and still plead guilty, but we can't do that in state court. So in state court, let's say you've got a suppression issue that you lost and you want to appeal it. Um, what you can do is you can, you can have a court trial on stipulated facts and you can say, we agree these things happened. I fully expect you to find him guilty. But this way we get to appeal the suppression issue. Okay, because if you plead him guilty, you waive those appeal issues. It doesn't happen that often, but something to keep in mind. Um, and you have 30 days from when the judgment and sentence is filed to submit that appeal or to the transcripts, things like that. Um, okay, we've got an assignment. Are, are there any questions? No? Okay. Um, we've got an assignment. What I've got there is a suppression issue. And I don't know if the, has this all been handed out to you guys now? <coughs> no. Okay. Just, at That's this fine. Point, just your samples have been distributed and the assignment comes out. Oh. Now. Wait with bated breath. Yeah. Um, well, basically, it's a stop of a vehicle. And I give you a sample motion to suppress. I want you to reproduce a motion to suppress. That's something you're going to have to do. That's pretty straightforward. And then you've got to write a, a short, what we call, letter brief to the judge in support of that motion. Do a little research so you can support your claim. And I think I give you a sample there, too. Um, I think it was a sample of one that I lost, but I shouldn't have lost. And in uh, our call tomorrow, each student is required to come with a question. So either about the exercise or about your presentation. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll we'll take questions tomorrow. But that's pretty much what I've got as far as the ins and outs of criminal defense. Um, I hope I covered it all. But if you've got questions tomorrow, let me know. We really appreciate you taking the time, especially uh, talking through everything, and get out of here so. Yeah, that would be great. Okay.